All right, thank you, Chuck. So I was going to uh, um, tell you a little bit about uh, the exciting times in our the Brown House over this last uh, 24 hours or so. Uh, Thursday night, Buddy, our dog, our 60-pound uh, mutt, pit bull mix mutt, started not eating, then every time he drank, he would throw it up. So, I mean, easy solution, kids, clean it up, right? <laughs> Friday came, um, and uh, so we were at, we had to go to school for stuff, and we got home, I was like, well, how the dog do? Threw up like 10 times, hasn't eaten anything. All just water, anytime you drink water, you throw it up. Like, that is not good. So we kept an eye on him real close. Saturday morning, took him to the bed, uh, get him checked out, and they're like, well, let's get an x-ray of him. Got to get him into surgery right away. Pick him up later. I said, okay. We knew something was going on. But they're like, look at the x-ray. See this in his stomach? He ate something. I don't know what it was. They're like, rag, a bag. I think just anything I remember with those two words. Uh, but like, look, there's some stuff here. He ate something there. Like, but, and he has eaten stuff before. He's just small children and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> eats anything. And um, so uh, they called me about 3.30 and said, okay, I'll come over. And um, it's funny because uh, this is a Sunland, the better of Sunland. And uh, he said, come around to the back because we'll be closed. But uh, So I came around to the back and there are two white doors and there's two small windows into their operating room. And one of them was open. And the doctor just like hanging out. Oh, hey, how you doing? Okay, is this how we do it here, I guess? <laughs> it's the strangest thing. So I just walked up and like, what are you doing here? <laughs> Got my dog on the table, all four legs straight up, and he's like hanging out. <laughs> They're like stitching them up. You want to do it? I'm, like, I'm good. Like, really, I'm good. And uh, then and they're like, come come around, come in here. Like in the operating room. <laughs> this is not like TV at all, folks. <laughs> I mean, it, I didn't scrub down or anything. They're like, come in. So I got in there, and they're like, he's like, look at this. There's about a ball about that big. Solid in that ball stuck in this stuff. And so nothing could be passed. Uh, and, and that ball is, we don't know where it came from. He, he plays with a ton of toys and balls, but that one, that size, you know, uh, so, um, so he, uh, oh, man, did you ever see a dog come out of surgery and anesthesia? I should have taken this, because it was, you know, you know the kids when they you get their wisdom teeth done and they're all there. You know, this dog was, he was, I'm pretty sure he was swearing at them. He was really upset with them. And they were just trying to get his things in. And they're, and she's super nice. And, you know, they're, they're holding his head. And she's, he's pulling all over the, the lady. And then, like, oh, his tummy feels interesting. I, it was like somebody turned on a, a hose full blast. He just started projectile vomiting everywhere. All over this lady. And they're like, this is what I'm paying for. You guys can do that. <laughs> And uh, he just stood there, and uh, he's much better today, though. So we're nursing him back. We could probably put a pretty good size in him to get him to him. Uh, so that was our buddy, and uh, uh, tonight's offering goes to the buddy, and he had a surgery fund. So um, they're like, you need to put a deposit on that. They're like, okay, we can do that. They like $750 deposit. That's not a deposit, that's like a full payment. There, right? <laughs> Oh, so that was uh, fun, but he's, he's back on his, his bed, so that was a little bit of a surprise for us, but we did something as well. So, so here we are, new uh, war, room. war Room, I'm going to get into this talk. Uh, again, this is based off a movie and a book, if you have a chance to watch it or read it, uh, make sure you go do that, and it talks about how uh, the War Room is, you know, it's, it's prayer, so uh, what can we do in our prayer life, in our spiritual life, just to, to, um, uh, to help with going through life and everything we're dealing with. So today we're talking about uh, God's grace and what that means to us. Uh, so to get us started, I want you to, uh, if you talk at your table just for uh, 30 seconds here, a minute at most, what was your biggest surprise gift you ever got? Just hit you out of the blue. You had no idea you were going to get it. You didn't think you deserved it. It was like, wow, I can't believe I got this gift, all right? I need to hear a few answers in about a minute, okay? Give us a little music for them to talk to. How about that? Okay, so they're talking to tables. 
and I need to hear an answer. The biggest surprise. You know, Christmas being married, you know that time where 
kind of gift are you getting each other and setting the tone for you know the rest of your life type of gift. Yeah. A lot of weight to that gift. Jennifer got me a Sega Genesis game system. Well, I knew what? Nailed it. Yeah. yeah, so that was a big, big surprise. Um, so if you've ever been a part of something that where you've got a big surprise, something that, that was for you, you felt like you didn't deserve, you felt like uh, you didn't even ask for it, uh, but it really, really worked for you great, it was awesome, it was just for you, you already have a sense, you already have an understanding of what God's grace is about. God's grace is a gift for you that uh, it, it's free of charge. You didn't even quite think about it, but it was given to you. So we're going to get right into Ephesians chapter 2. So if you've got the Bible app, you want to follow along again. Otherwise, I'll have it up here on the screen. Ephesians chapter 2. A man named Paul wrote this. Paul is an interesting guy because at one time in his life, he hated Christians so much, he wanted them killed, and did have them killed. God got a hold of them and transformed his life, and then he became the biggest evangelist for God that we know and wrote a lot of the Bible. So we, we, we catch up here. He's explaining to the people in the town the big difference from the way religion was done before Jesus came to how it is with Jesus involved. Because before it was a lot of rules, a lot of do this, do this, do this, sacrifice this, do this, uh, in order to uh, you know to get to heaven. But now that it's a new new way of thinking. So if you kind of put yourself in that context where uh, they're trying to get grasp of this new idea, right? So here it is. So, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace. This is the first time we see this. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable riches of His grace expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Right? So you can see that goes through Christ Jesus coming from God. Verse 8, for it is by grace, and this is the third time we hear this in this short passage, for it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now back in verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved, it is a gift of God, a gift of God. So he can he, he give us all out of the there is nothing we can do ourselves, friends. It is only because of the grace of God that we can save. Right? No matter what you're trying to do, no matter where you're going with, it is not going to happen unless it comes from God. And that is the way we can be saved. And then and he kind of says that again in verse 9. He says, so it's not by works. It's not by doing stuff so that no one can boast. So he removes all of that human element to say, God is the one that's provided us. So grace, if we were to define it, is, is a gift that we don't deserve. So as God created the world, created humans, humans started screwing up big time. Humans continue to screw up big time. All you have to do is watch the movies every night. Right, friends? Right? So God said, I love this world so much. I love humans so much. I want to save you. I'm going to send my son as a gift that we don't deserve in their place. So that's what grace is. Now, the United Methodist Church, which we are part of, was founded off the ideas of a man named John Wesley. Uh, here's what John looks like. Uh, John uh, was a, you probably know CD guy, very, uh, very, um, not, what was a very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Methodical, yeah, thank you, very methodical. And uh, so he actually had these small groups meet once a week. And if you were in his small group, or you followed one of his small groups, he had very strict rules. You're late, don't show up. You're out of the group. One time. That was it. You're going to pray for each other. You're going to confess your sins to each other. It was it was hardcore stuff. But it, his ideas spread like wildfire. It was just what, what everyone was looking for. So all these small groups uh, sprouted up everywhere. And actually, the United Methodist Church wasn't... John Wesley did not found the United Methodist Church. It was found off, based off of his ideas and his methods. So it's called the Methodist Church. Because uh, uh, everyone 
everyone watching from the outside is like, wow, those, those crazy Methodists. <laughs> I think we still say that sometimes, right? Those crazy Methodists. Well, look at, look at how, how detailed. Look at their meeting every day at this time. They, they don't miss it. Um, so kind of one of the foundational things he talks about was grace. They talk about it in three ways. I'm going to share it with you right now. Uh, it's called convenient grace, justifying grace, and sanctifying grace. Uh, those are the three basic foundations of, of, of the United Methodist Church that uh, we got from John uh, Wesley. So the first one, this prevenient grace. This is God's active presence in our lives. God's active presence in our lives. Whether you know God at the time or not, is His active presence in your life. When we do baptisms of babies and other we talk about prevenient grace. We, we, we talk and parents say, hey, you know what? We, we understand that there's a God and His grace is alive and already working in this baby's life. Now, we're going to raise this baby so that when they become old enough, they're going to accept Jesus Christ. Or at least know, have the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ in the life. And that's that prevenient grace where God is already paving the way. He's out in front of you. And he's already working on your life, whether you know it or not. It's kind of like this idea that this grace is out there and you can't get away from it. As soon as your feet hit this, this earth, God brings you in your life. So that's a prevenient grace. Now the justifying grace, this is the second part. Justifying grace. If you kind of use that word and break it down to just as if I never sinned. Just if you were justified. Just as if I were never sinned. This is kind of the piece where God, us, and Jesus all get together. Reconciliation, pardon, and restoration. How about that? It all comes together. That's that moment when you say, hey Jesus, I need you in my life. I cannot do this anymore. I'm tired. I'm weak. I'm screwing it up big time. I can't do it. I need you in my life. Justification occurs. Justifying grace. Life. Romans 5 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So this justifying grace, it, it, it didn't say, I'm gonna, God didn't say, I'm going to wait till everybody gets their act together. <laughs> when would that happen? <laughs> Never, right? But instead, he's like, Yeah, I know they're still screwed up, they're still messing up, but I'm not going to stop for that. Here we go. This is what it's going to be. I'm going to get uh, my son involved with us. Alright? So that's that moment when you say, yes, Jesus, in my life. You were justified. You were restored. Uh, everything has been reset, right? Everything has been clean. You are now one of God's children. Then that third part is called the sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace. God's ongoing grace in our lives that is transforming us daily. As we get older and as we grow in Christ, as we become to understand maybe better wisdom, maybe understanding how God works in our life, that uh, it transforms us. But hopefully if you look from maybe today from a couple of years ago, you feel you've grown. You feel like your, your spiritual maturity is at a different level. Maybe you don't get mad so quick anymore. Maybe, you, maybe you're, a, you're not so quick to judge anymore where you used to be. That's God's sanctifying grace working in your life. You, you've accepted Jesus, and now God's going to begin transforming us into what He created us to be. You see, grace should be evident in the way we live our lives. And I'll tell you what, one way that uh, I know you can check this real quick is get on the phone with some customer service records out there. <laughs> How long does your patience last? <laughs> How kind are you with them? I, call, I was trying to, I was working with something with Mason at college, and uh, my cell phone kept dropping out. But of course, it wasn't my fault. It wasn't my cell phone. It was, I was like, oh, they hung up for me again. And you know, you just want to pick it up and like, I don't know what's going to happen. No, we offer grace and say, oh, sorry about that. Where were we? And we keep on going. So it's real easy to, to offer grace. So uh, Colossians 3.13, some grace life, if you were to put it like that. Grace, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Again, we go back to we were all sinners when Jesus decided, uh, God decided to send His Son to forgive us. Are we forgiving in the same manner 
God forgave us. Right? Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, kind of continuing off our first passage, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. That's before that justification moment there, right? Which is being corrupted by deceitful desires. To be made new in the attitude of your minds. And to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That's sanctification. That's that grace that continues to work in our lives. You see, when you do those in your life, that is living the gospel. That is the grace life. Where there's something else is driving you. It's not your own desires. It's not your own wants and needs. Something else is inside you. And that something else is God's grace. Moving you to help people. Moving you to share with people. Moving you to love people. Uh, to those people that society doesn't want to We're saying, we have to help. Right? The world needs more grace. Like I said, it doesn't take long uh, to look around the headlines. Last week was a tough week in the United States. The world needs more grace. A lot of people don't experience grace. So they get mad quickly. They stop back quickly. I was uh, just at Walmart when I got my glasses and I saw some, some uh, uh, young lady walk in and kind of bring out that nice uh, breeder who's uh, about 85 because of the red was squashed. You know, and, uh, and I saw him take, he was offering grace to her, and I can see that. You know. But the world needs more grace, so when they don't experience grace, they don't have it. So we, you have grace in your life. You can offer it. So how did your life offer grace? Just a quick question here. Through your family, through your friends, through your work life, how are you offering grace? How is it in your community? And if you don't believe you can change your community by your actions, I'm telling you you can because it will spread like wildfire. Just like John Wesley, one guy started something and it spread like wildfire. People will see it and people want it. People, What's going on in your life? Why is, uh, you know, why are you so calm? Well, where are you getting that from? Because I need that. That's God's grace working in your life. And it's probably already been working in the life of the person who's coming to ask you. Something that has a nudge to right? All right, so I got a clip here to show you from this movie, The War Room. Uh, and, and in this clip, there's an older lady named Miss Clara. And she's kind of been mentoring and, get, and, and connecting, growing this relationship with a, a young lady named Elizabeth. And in this scene, uh, kind of dealing with some marriage issues, and Elizabeth is really upset, and Miss Clara is guiding her and giving her some direction. Uh, so take a look at this. Elizabeth, you're going to have to help me write more, but you'll get the gist of it when we read it. Actually, I'm not going to read it. My question to you is this. In light of all these wrongs, does God still love Tom? We both know he does. Do you? Now, Miss Clara, you're meddling. <laughs> There's love in my heart. But it's just buried under a lot of frustration. So he needs grace. Grace? I don't know that he deserves grace. Do you deserve grace? Miss Claire, you have a habit of backing me up in a corner and making me squirm. I feel the same way. But the question still remains, do you deserve grace? The Bible says that no one is righteous, not even one. For we have all sinned. So, really, none of us deserve grace. But we all still want God's forgiveness. Elizabeth, it comes down to this. Jesus shed his blood on the cross. He died for you, even when you did not deserve it. And he rose from the grave and offers forgiveness and salvation for anyone who turns to him. Also says that we can't ask him to forgive us while refusing to forgive us. I know, Miss Clara, but that's just so hard to do. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But that's where grace comes in. He gives us grace and he helps us to give it to others, even when they don't deserve it. 
We all deserve judgment. And that is what all God gives us when we don't repent and believe in His Son. I had to forgive me for something. And it wasn't easy, but it freed me. Elizabeth, there's not room for you and God on the throne of your heart. It's either Him or it's you. You need to step down. Now, if you want victory, you're going to have to first surrender. Do I just back off and choose to forgive and then just let Him walk all over? God is a good defense attorney. Trust me to Him. And then you can turn your focus to the real enemy. The real enemy? The one that wants to remain in. The one that wants to distract you and deceive you and divide you from the Lord and your husband. You see, that's how it works. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he is stealing your joy. He is killing your faith. And he's trying to destroy you. If I were you, I would get my heart right with God. And you to do your fight in prayer. And you need to kick the real enemy out of your home with the word of God. It's time for you to fight a little bit. It's time for you to fight for your marriage. It's time for you to fight the real enemy. It's time for you to take off the gloves and do it. There is a good place to Good message, huh? God's grace was, from the beginning of it, is, and always will be. It's a man. We've got to invite him into your heart. Now we're going to get into a time of communion. My, uh, help you come up here. And, and, and this time of communion is remembering exactly what this is all about. What this grace is, and, and who it's offered to. The answer is everyone, anytime. If you're looking somewhere else to fill your life, one place you're going to find it is through God's grace. And this time of communion is remembering what that's about. Remembering that God said while we were still sinners, He decided to send His Son, restore us, complete us, and make us whole again. And remember that during communion. So Jesus was sitting with His disciples, his best friends, and, and he gave thanks and he broke that bread in front of him and he said, this is my body and it's been broken just for you. Each and every time you eat that you do remember what I've done for you. Next he gave thanks and he called up the cup and he said, this is my blood that's been poured out for you. Each and every time you drink this would you remember what I've done for you. I've been a part of your life and I want to be a part of your life. He's just going to keep after